Almost everyone in the United States at one time or another has traveled at least a stretch of old Route 66. It's um, the road where the people from Oklahoma went to California. It's a part of American history. Just the name conjures up images of going somewhere. To me, it's going back in, in, back in time, seeing things that I grew up with. So let's travel this blue highway all the way from Chicago to Santa Monica. Route 66 is still a magic name. I believe that will never change. And I hope you agree once you join me on my beloved Mother Road. I'm Michael Wallace, author of Route 66, The Mother Road, and your host on this video journey that we call Getting There. This program is about taking time to escape the super slab and return to the way America used to be. Lordy, lordy. <laughs> Once you're out there, on the remaining alignments of the old highway, look for a potpourri of attractions, a litany of diversions and laurelize, all capable of getting you to stop. For example, in Missouri, there's a length of old highway near Devil's Elbow that comes complete with concrete curbing that engineers intended to keep folks on the straight and narrow, but instead became a nuisance and even caused some bloody wrecks by throwing vehicles off course. Then further on at Galena, Kansas, one of my favorite spots is the town museum, situated in a converted train station. Don't plan to just walk through this one. There's too much to absorb, too much to see too much to listen to. In our first video excursion down the Mother Road, we briefly visited McLean, the Texas Panhandle's version of the last picture show in a diehard Route 66 town. What we showed left some people clamoring for more. This museum, this Devil's Rope Museum, is, represents the largest collection of barbed wire and so forth in the world. Yes, yeah. that is correct. Is it possible for you to show me how to make some devil's rope? You bet. I've got a machine right here. I'll show really? you how to put a barb on a wire. And see, people that like to come up a little bit closer, yeah. we'll show you here how what a treat. Uh, Mesri's Glidden made the first set of barbs with a, a coffee bean grinder off of a chuck wagon. Now, if you look at these, these were made out of old windmill parts. And if you watch, all of the barbs are put on one single wire. And watch how I spin it around here. Okay, now there, there was a wire. And according to Mr. Johnson, who was Mr. Glidden's hard man, he said, we put the barb on the wire, we laid it on a piece of iron, and we wrapped it smartly. Okay, then you hook them into this hook on the end. And then you take another slick wire that has no barbs and you hook it here. Yeah. And then you turn this crank and you twist the two wires together. This makes the barb stationary. Oh, and this is what you come up with. It's uh, one wire has got the barbs on it and the other wire makes the barb stationary. Barbed wire was one of the few things that were invented that was invented right the first time. <laughs> no matter if you're in Texas or any of the other Route 66 states, you'll have a chance to see some towns that haven't quite made it. For one reason or another, they gave up, caved in, blew away. Cuervo in eastern New Mexico barely hangs on. Cuervo was established in the 1800s along the Santa Fe Railroad tracks. It was surrounded by good grazing land where Native Americans raised their sheep. 
And with the railroad, they had a way to get their sheep to market. Cuervo became a prosperous shipping center. It still was during those heyday years of Route 66, and it remained for some time a hospitable town. Although with the demise of Route 66, it finally had to give up the ghost. Today, things aren't quite the same at all. Native Americans still may tend their flocks along the mesas above what remains of the mother road, but the thrill is gone at Cuervo. Some changes have been good in Route 66 country, but some of them, well, let's say the old ways were probably better. When Route 66 was built through New Mexico and Arizona, it helped to expose the culture of Native Americans to the rest of us. But at the same time, it changed forever the world of the Apache, Navajo, Hopi, and Acoma. At Peach Springs, Arizona, young girls who had been taught traditional dance and the old ways help to keep their heritage alive on one of the best surviving segments of Route 66. One of the most picked upon towns, one of the most maligned places on all of Route 66 has to be Needles, California. I don't buy it. For most true blue road warriors, Needles is a desert oasis, a place of history, culture, and refuge. Although Needles has the reputation of being one of the hottest places on earth, many residents say they simply don't care. There's always air conditioning. And at least in the winter, they don't have snow as high as an elephant's eye. When we come back, a look at some postcards from Route 66. No matter what your destination, be it Needles, Tucumcari, or LA, sometimes it's good to slide off the road and send home some greetings from the Mother Road, a message to the folks back home. Postcards and the sharing of the trip are very important. Those of us who truly love and appreciate the magic of Route 66 know this. We've heard the music in that ribbon of asphalt and concrete. We value the myriad of entertaining postcards from the road. These postcards are pure slices of Americana that act like visual shorthand for every journey made on Route 66. Postcards bearing hastily dashed messages and greetings from the road bring at least a little bit of the vacation experience to the folks who keep home fires burning, who feed the pets, collect the mail, water the plants. If the mood is just right and the image on the front of the card works its spell, the recipient usually wishes just for a second or two that he or she could actually be out there on the highway taking it all in with those who are good enough to write. A trip down Route 66 is in order for all of those who find time sacred and want to experience the America of before, of yesterday. The road of John Steinbeck, Will Rogers, Woody Guthrie, Mickey Mantle, Dorothea Lang, Jack Kerouac. It's still the best path for dreamers and ramblers, drifters and pilgrims on a quest. The truth of the matter is, I was angry, and I knew this book had to be written. I knew what Route 66, with this highway, with that venerable old ribbon of concrete and asphalt, had done for this nation, for the eight states it runs through, for legions of people. I knew all about the good and the bad and ugly that transpired on that road, 
on that varicose old highway. And I was really mad. I was damn sick and tired of people talking about that road, about my road, as if it was gone in the past tense. It's no longer there. I knew that the government tried to decertify the road and they built these five interstates to parallel it going all the way out and they might have thrown away all the shields and signs and slung them in the grass and they might have bypassed whole towns and bypassed people's lives but I knew that the survivors were out there. I knew they were there. I knew George Rook was out there. I knew the people were out there in California and in the desert and on the high plains and in the cities and in the little towns and on the ranches. I knew Angel Delgadillo was trimming hair. I knew Lillian Redmond was switching on the neon swallows, the blue swallow, every night luring those truckers like a Lorelei off that damnable super slab back to the real road, back to real America, back to America before it wasn't generic. And that, my friends, is why I wrote that book. That's why that book needed to be written. Driving the highway promises not only adventure, but evokes feelings of fantasy and romance and gives the traveler a sense of personal involvement. Above all else, Route 66 is a part of America that offers testimony to where we have been and what remains of our past. It shows us the secret corners and hidden towns we still might find if we merely dare to exit the interstate highway. But to do that, we have to believe that life begins at the off-ramp. Then roll down the windows and with the radio playing, the car engine humming, open our eyes to the past and maybe, just maybe, discover something of ourselves. Always remember this time-tested truth. Route 66 is magic. Route 66 means getting there. Enjoy the journey. One thing's for sure about blue highways, they're always changing. What's there on one trip might not be there on your next. So the true road warrior knows to savor every moment. When we come back, we'll see what's changed and what's remained the same on the mother road over the years. You're watching Blue Highways TV. It hardly seems possible that it's been 75 years since federal highway officials looked at a map, drew a line between Chicago and LA, connected the dots, and gave it the name 66. I don't think they could have ever imagined what mystic proportions their creation would take on. I've been a dedicated Route 66 road warrior for years now, since my first adventure down America's Main Street when I was a boy. And I've seen the highway change for better and for worse. As a son of Route 66, it's been part of my life's work to document those transitions, both in books and on videos. So it's only natural, as the fabled highway turns 75, that we take to the two lane once more to report on what remains and what's changed along the shoulders of Route 66. It all began in the 1920s when the automobile first stirred the imagination of the American people. It allowed workers to live outside the cities and commute to work. It ended the farmer's isolation, and most importantly, it provided an escape. In 1926, federal highway officials linked together a dazzling array of Indian paths, cowboy trails, and wagon roads, paved them over and built one of the first all-weather highways linking the Midwest with California. When the highway designation signs went up, Route 66 ran right through the heart and soul of America. The old route parallels Interstate 55 in Illinois. Then 44 slashes across Missouri and by the corner of Kansas. 
44 turns to 40 in Oklahoma, across Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, into California, as far as Barstow. From there, the old highway cuts south and then west, all the way to the Roaring Pacific. The most famous highway in the United States, possibly the world, Route 66 is still going and blowing through eight states across 2,400 miles, three time zones, from Chicago in the east to Santa Monica in the west. But why Route 66? Out of all the highways, why is this one the highway everyone wants to be on? It was a change of, of time period in our United States history. It was a change in our transportation modes. It was a change in lifestyles. I think Route 66 is an opportunity for people to get out and explore the highways of yesteryear, the old blue highways. And, and it's kind of... It's, it's so campy. It is, but... People in America are a little bit tired of everything being canned. They're tired of the chain. They're tired of everything exactly the same. It's a chance to reconnect with small town America, to get out of the cities, to get out on the open road, get out in the deserts and the mountains and the forests and just live life a little slower pace. And that's part of what Route 66 is all about, taking it easy. It was a time when it was more about the journey than it was the destination. It's the romance of the open road, freedom. Everybody knows Route 66. They don't know Route 99, they don't know, you know, but Route 66, it resonates. You can make the trip in either direction, but for the real road warrior, the preferred journey is west. A lot of people travel 66 from west to east, but the way to do it, to get the full impact of the experience, is to move west. So, we begin our journey at the Chicago Art Institute on the edge of Grant Park. Make a left off Michigan Avenue and head west. We're on old 66, snaking through the land of Lincoln. One of the first things you notice is the great number of restaurants along the Mother Road in Illinois. It's always been that way. You're hardly out of the Loop District before you come to one perennial favorite, Lou Mitchell's on Jackson Boulevard. Lou himself passed away in 1999, but his tradition of dispensing a complimentary box of milk duds to every lady customer lives on. Illinois doesn't have the number of tourist traps that some of the western states do, but they make up for it in their variety of eating establishments. And why not? Road grub is as American as, well, apple pie. An endless variety of gastronomic delights are concocted and consumed every day, all along the old road. But I still maintain a fondness for down-home vittles, the blue plate specials, food made with care and sweat and served in authentic diners and greasy spoons. Whether it's scrambled or deep-fried, grilled or broiled, nothing tastes quite as good as rations dished out from the kitchen by the very person who cooked them. If fried chicken is to your liking, Delray's Chicken Basket in Willowbrook has been serving their plump and juicy, specially seasoned chicken for more than 55 years. We were figuring it out the other day and we sell about a ton and a half for two tons of chicken a week. But be careful, when it's fresh out of the fryer, chicken can require at least a dozen napkins. Farther down the highway in Springfield, there's a culinary palace famous for fried food of another sort. They're fun to eat, they're easy to eat, they're not messy to eat. This is where Buzz Waldmeyer's dad invented the Cozy Dog, which he claimed tasted like a $5 piece of shrimp. People are used to it. It's, uh, they gotta have their Cozy Dog or they just can't survive the day. Ed Waldmeyer passed on in 1993 but Buzz is still making Cozy Dogs and still keeping his dad's recipe a secret. Cozy Dog was invented as a brainchild of my father who uh, came, came up with the idea back in the middle 40s. He invented a process to make uh, corn dogs real quickly. Started selling what he called crusty curs at the, uh, right off, off the air base in Amarillo, Texas at the USO Club. Started up going gangbusters. My mother didn't like the name Krusty Curs, so she renamed it Cozy Dogs 
and then she's the one that came up with the design for the logo, the two little hot dogs hugging each other and everything. Well, I was born on, on Route 66 down there in Litchfield. Well, not on the highway, but I was born in a hospital to the town there. <laughs> Close enough, anyway. Close enough. You don't have to travel very far in Illinois before running into more popular eating establishments like the Ariston Cafe in Litchfield. Happy 75th anniversary, Route 66, from the Ariston Cafe. Happy 75th anniversary, Route 66, from the Punk of Punk's Grove. <laughs> Beside the fabled highway, as it passes Francis Martin's farm near Raymond, there is an Illinois tourist attraction like no other. Since 1959, Our Lady of the Highways has been gazing across the old road, her hands folded in perpetual prayer, keeping a watchful eye on motorists. Since we first brought our cameras this way in 1994, the Dixie Trucker's Home considered the first real truck stop in Illinois, has gotten a bit of a facelift. On the outside, a new sign. On the inside, down a hallway that once directed road-weary truckers from the fuel pumps to the restaurant is the new Route 66 Hall of Fame. Hung along each wall are memories and mementos of the mother road, all dedicated to the people who labored hard to keep wheels rolling along old 66. When we visited the Chain of Rocks Bridge back in 1994, this is all we could see of the famous span that once carried Route 66 traffic across the Mississippi. The unique two-lane toll bridge was overgrown, chained off, and abandoned. Not so today. In one of the most spectacular Route 66 revival efforts, locals have cleaned her up and reopened the bridge as part of an extensive 40-mile trail system. People have come from all over the world to walk and bike on this mile-long bridge that's 24 feet wide, and they just seem to enjoy getting out there. We get several hundred people a day on the weekends. So now, you can cross the longest pedestrian bridge in the world and picnic within sight of the span's one-of-a-kind dog leg designed to help riverboats pass safely underneath. Well, no riverboats pass under the Chain of Rocks Bridge these days. Instead, Mississippi River barges use a nearby canal to get to and from St. Louis. As Route 66 celebrated her 75th anniversary in 2001, we toured the famous Blue Highway to document the changes she's undergone in her first three-quarter century. On our next show, we'll tell you what's happened to St. Louis's notorious no-till motel, the Coral Court, El Reno's Big Eight Motel, and the popular You Drop In. Until then, I'm Michael Wallace. Travel well. <laughs>